for cheaper than the methods manufacturing methods which are so cost effective and the advancement like 3d printing can make uh, small gas turbines possible today in this world our system is derived from the aircraft engine and is going to be extremely reliable and the maintenance or the service cost will be close to zero and uh, this will augment extremely cheap power for the end user Design doesn't belong to one discipline. Design is an interdisciplinary science where you combine mechanical engineering, electronics, computer science, physics, chemistry and so on. Uh, we do have a wide variety of uh, labs in the department which uh, give the students training on what are the essential elements that are required for design. In other words, we wanted to bring the joy of engineering. But there are two things in this. One is we wanted to give the fundamentals of design. as an undergraduate program and then bring domain knowledge to the postgraduate program straight away go to the applications and teach the practice of design through an applied design process or product the students have to spend an entire semester in the industry and with this they are able to integrate their learning with industrially relevant problems the actual process of creating new design requires a special set of skills which we promote in our department the cancer situation in india is very alarming if you look at the treatment strategy and the success rate is very poor to know the cancer we need to have the cancer tissue from the patient whatever the treatment we are giving to indian patients today it's all the medicine is developed against caucasian population or western population four years back iit madras with the funding from department of science and technology government of india we established the india's first national community biobank with the aim to collect the tissue from cancer patients and using this tissue we are in the process of establishing india specific cancer genome database this cancer database will help you to understand or identify the biomarker specific to indian population for a better management of cancer situation in india So I think uh, we can just uh, start at exactly five, and we also have participants who have made them. So hello and good day to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is Rudra from the Office of Global Engagement, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the sixty-eighth uh, webinar from the Iris webinar series. So the Institute of Eminence Scheme, uh, which is launched by the Government of India to empower higher education institution and to help them become world-class teaching. and research institutes uh, iit madras is proud to have been selected uh, as such uh, institute of eminence a total of 68 research initiative belonging to 21 identified clusters are presently underway at iit madras as and as a part of these initiatives uh, the iris webinar series aim to showcase the innovative research that is being generated to various stakeholders like students researchers industrialists and policy makers so from the advanced manufacturing cluster the research initiative presenting uh, today uh, titled is uh, advanced laser material processing led by professor g l samuel so to introduce professor samuel uh, professor samuel is currently working as the uh, professor in the Absolutely. department of mechanical engineering iit madras uh, uh, dr g l samuel Uh, received his phd from iit madras in the year 2001 and he worked as post doctoral research fellow at the department of mechanical engineering uh, at uh, uh, south korea during 2003 to 2005 his research interests includes conventional and non conventional manufacturing metrology and computer aided inspection micro machining cad cam His publication include 43 international journal papers and uh, 49 national international conference papers. So Professor G L Samuel will be in charge of uh, non-machining, metrology, and characterization aspects of uh, the proposed center of excellence. 
and it's my honor to welcome professor nilesh vasa and professor uh, gandham panikumar who has joined as the uh, speaker of today's program with uh, professor uh, koichi sasaki joined as the moderator i request uh, professor g l samuel to take over yeah uh, thank you mr rudra for that introduction so a very good evening to all of you so a special uh, welcome to the moderator of this day professor uh, koichi sasaki from hokkaido university in japan so we also welcome um, professor nilesh vasan professor g fani kumar from uh, the center of excellence uh, from uh, the laser advanced laser material processing uh, to deliver the talk today so as uh, we have been uh, talking about uh, the institute of eminence so our, uh, we have the privilege that the iit madras has been given uh, the privilege of being an institute of eminence in the country uh, by mhrd government of uh, india and under that we have several uh, centers of excellence and our uh, center it is the proposed center of uh, excellence for advanced laser material processing so we have given the uh, first uh, uh, webinar in which we have given the details about uh, various faculty who have been working and then the works which we are going to carry out in this so we have the range of uh, lasers right from uh, continuous lasers the nano pulse lasers ultra short pulse lasers and we have gambit of applications right from cutting joining uh, shock peening uh, welding brazing and vacuum processes and several of them and we also have the uh, facilities for inspecting Uh, various characteristics of uh, these uh, surfaces which have been machined so on basically we are looking in the micro and nano level so thus we welcome you today uh, for this uh, webinar so it is my privilege and honor to uh, introduce uh, professor koichi uh, aki so we are also glad that though it is uh, in the night after dinner time for them Uh, but still professor sasaki has agreed uh, to moderate this and taken all the efforts so we thank you professor koichi sasaki and we welcome you so professor sasaki has graduated from the department of uh, electrical and electronic engineering from school of engineering in nagoya university in japan in 1987 he receives the uh, doctorate uh, from electrical and electronics engineering at the graduate school of engineering in nagoya university in 1991 so from 1991 to 2009 uh, he was a faculty member at plasma nano engineering uh, research center in the graduate school of engineering in nagoya uh, university then from 2010 he has been working as a professor in the division of uh, quantum science and engineering in the graduate school of engineering at uh, hokkaido university japan so his areas of uh, specialization uh, include laser ablation uh, basic and applied plasma science and their applications so professor uh, sasaki has been uh, here in india and visited uh, before the lockdown and uh, he has been an eminent professor in this uh, area and even one of my uh, student uh, murugesh has uh, gone uh he has completed his ms here and then gone to be do his uh, phd at uh, hokkaido university under the guidance of uh, professor sasaki and professor sasaki is uh, one of the collaborators for this uh, center of excellence in advanced laser material processing so i take this uh, privilege to welcome uh, professor sasaki and hand over the remaining part of the program thank you professor please go um thank you very much Uh, professor samuel for uh, kind and detailed introduction for me um my name is uh, uh, koichi sasaki i'm i'm now working at hokkaido university japan <clears throat> uh, my uh, research area is the fundamentals and applications of low temperature plasmas and also i'm working on the applications of lasers to uh, measurement techniques and uh, uh, material processing such as laser ablation um it's my uh, pleasure and the honor to have a chance to join the project of uh, indian institute of technology madras 
and also it's my uh, also my pleasure to work as the moderator of the, the webinar today. So um, <clears throat> today uh, we have uh, two speakers from both uh, both from IIT Madras. One is a Professor Vasa, and uh, uh, the other is uh, Professor Paniksha. Um, so uh, let me introduce the first speaker. First speaker is uh, uh, Professor Vasa. The Professor Nirish Varsa is a professor in the Department, Department of Engineering Design, IIT Madras. And uh, Professor Varsa received the bachelor degree in the production engineering from the Bombay University and uh, a master of technology degree in the mechanical engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. And uh, he uh, received a doctor of engineering or a PhD degree in the field of uh, electronic device engineering from the Kyushu University, Japan in 1997. And uh, for a while he worked as a faculty member at Kyushu University. Uh, it may be for 10 years, I guess. And uh, he worked as an assistant professor and also probably he worked as the associate professor in Kyushu University. And uh, since uh, 2006, he has been a faculty member uh, of the Department of Engineering Design, IIT Madras. Uh, his uh, specific area, research area, uh, is uh, laser uh, micromanufacturing, laser assisted sensing, biophotonics devices. And actually, I know Professor Vasa uh, for a long time, from a long time ago, maybe 30 years, 30 years ago when he was a PhD student in Kyushu University. Uh, we did not see for a long time, but uh, about three years ago, I met him again. And it's uh, really my pleasure to work, work, work with him again. So, uh, Fasa Sam, please start your talk. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sasaki. Thank you so much for introducing me, uh, as well as, uh, I am also thankful to Professor Samuel for uh, right bringing up this uh, center of excellence and a proposal towards center of excellence on advanced laser material processing. Uh, so today, uh, as a part of uh, this uh, IRIS uh, right uh, lecture series or webinar series, I should say, uh, I, I'll be presenting on laser assisted surface structuring for functional devices. Okay, I am Vasa from Department of Engineering Design and uh, I'll uh, try to present it. Okay, one minute, I'll just go to the presentation mode. It will be easy, maybe. Okay, uh, all of you can see the screen, isn't it? So that's, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah. Please, Okay, please. yes, okay, one minute, huh? This is, uh, I'll have to. Uh, make it okay. Uh, just hold on. Huh? Just hold on. sometimes uh, because of this uh, screen, I cannot see the complete this part. That's why I have kept even a print out with me so it will be easier. So first I'll start with uh, uh, the part laser beam machining and micro machining. As we all know uh, that laser beam micro machining involves right? uh, light matter interaction with a feature size uh, less than a millimeter order. Okay, We know that uh, laser has some specific characteristics such as coherence, narrow spectral width, well-defined spatial and temporal characteristics, which are very useful for producing micro features on various types of materials, ranging from metals, semiconductors, polymers, as well as composite materials, ceramics, etc. And the laser processing is a non-contact process. It provides a very high resolution and precision uh, due to the localized heating of the material and minimal redeposition. Okay? So this process is flexible because it allows uh, not only removal of material, uh, not only drilling, cutting, welding, 
uh, means not only removal, but it allows welding, adding of materials such as additive manufacturing, surface structuring, forming of many uh, different uh, shapes and sizes. That's also possible using laser, uh, right, as the, uh, um, a, a tool. Uh, now, uh, this light matter interaction uh, depends upon photon energy. So as you can see here, uh, that the photon energy, when it is uh, three to seven electron volt, uh, this, electro this energy is sufficient enough to break the chemical bonds. And that's why it is very much useful uh, in terms of uh, uh, removal, uh, breaking the chemical bonds in case of uh, some resins, some polymers, uh, and some other materials. And this process doesn't involve any heat generation directly. Uh, basically, it's a photochemical uh, reaction. And that's why it is also known as photolithic process. On the other hand, uh, laser also with a very high intensity beam, laser beam with uh, wavelengths with the photon energy less than 2.5 electron volt. Uh, this uh, photon energy is decided based on the frequency. So H into nu, where H is the Planck's constant, nu is the frequency. Uh, and we know that uh, speed of light or laser beam depends upon wavelength and frequency. So sometimes I may be talking in terms of frequency. Sometimes I may talk in terms of photon energy or wavelength. Uh, they are all right internally interconnected. We can easily uh, uh, right, uh, determine from this any of these uh, parameters the corresponding other values. Now coming back here, here's in case of a photothermal process, it's an heat absorption via material interaction. Okay, And it involves melting, uh, vaporization, and then ablation, and even to some extent for certain other applications, uh, deposition as well. So this photothermal process uh, is widely used for various uh, metals, semiconductors, ceramics, etc., for melting, ablation, or deposition, or uh, purpose. Then nonlinear approach uh, is uh, the extension of uh, this, uh, we can say a photothermal approach, but slightly different in the sense that the intensity of the laser pulse is so much so large and with a very short period of time, ultra short period of time, the energy is being delivered uh, and which allows multi photon uh, absorption, ionization, etc. And this process uh, is it involves uh, absorption through uh, uh, not through direct uh, right uh, energy level transfer, but through the multi-photon absorption, etc. And that's why it is a nonlinear uh, process in absorption, and that's a nonlinear approach of uh, uh, right material processing. So now, uh, first couple, few points, I would like to just give you an idea uh, to the audience that what are the uh, aspects related to laser which are useful and then I will go to the uh, real part of this uh, of research activities in terms of laser structuring, laser doping, laser microscribing, etc. Uh, now let's start. Uh, we know that when laser beam with intensity uh, right I0 interacts with the material, of course there will be some reflections uh, because of the right material characteristics, uh, surface structure of the material, etc., some light may get reflected, scattering, etc., may happen. Uh, however, uh, some part of this uh, intensity la laser beam will get coupled to the material, and this coupling go uh, is uh, through the absorption of this. Right, so it depends upon material characteristics and the wavelength of the laser beam which determines the amount of energy which can get coupled through this absorption. And when this energy gets coupled through the absorption, and if the intensity of the laser beam is large enough, it ends up with uh, that energy which is getting absorbed, laser energy gets end up in heat energy or the heat is getting conducted through the material. Of course, the conduction is a material characteristics uh, and uh, then when the intensity of the laser beam is large enough, we end up with the melting. Subsequently, 
depending upon the pulse uh, energy and its input, it goes to the vaporization and material ejection, plasma formation, and right and ablation of the material. So all this uh, process is uh, a part of the thermal uh, cycle uh, with the laser intensity. However, there is one very important aspect related to this process is uh, when we work with long pulse laser, when I say long pulse, generally it may be uh, from microsecond order to nanosecond uh, order pulsed laser. Uh, what we see is uh, material recast, uh, surface debris, Electro, uh, ejected material uh, getting recast, surface debris getting deposited, etc. And it also generates uh, heat affected zone uh, as the heat is getting uh, diffused in the material, depending upon the material characteristics. And this heat affected zone uh, or the depth of heat diffusion uh, depends upon parameter D, which is nothing but heat diffusivity, uh, depends upon thermal conductivity, inversely proportional to the density and the specific heat. So this heat diffusivity is a material characteristics. And on the other hand, this parameter T is the laser pulse width. So when we are working with a nanosecond or microsecond laser pulse width, the heat affected zone is significant in nature uh, uh, as compared to when we work with a sub picosecond or picosecond order pulsed laser. In this case, uh, the interaction is slightly different because the electron relaxation lifetime and uh, is uh, 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 or uh, uh, other way down, the pulse width of this laser is so short that it is even smaller than, shorter than the electron relaxation lifetime. And because of this, what happens is uh, the heat energy, which is generated due to the electron and lattice vibration, structure vibrations and uh, interactions in case of a long pulse beam is, is partially or completely avoided over here. And most of the heat energy in laser intensity, which is delivered, is uh, will uh, be useful for uh, material melting and uh, finally plasma formation, plasma pump formation, and material ejection or vaporization. To the extent possible, we will not see a direct material ejection as it is observed here because uh, the intensity is so large enough that the material gets vaporized in plasma form and it gets away uh, very easily from the surface. So this is uh, the aspect. Based on this, uh, what type of lasers are generally used for such micro manufacturing applications? Of course, initially, uh, uh, right, there were some attempts of using CO2 laser for such uh, micro manufacturing applications as well, uh, whose wavelength is 10.6 micrometer, uh, but pulse width is much longer as well as uh, wavelength is also longer and it results in a uh, heat affected zone as well as uh, right thermal conductivity problems, et cetera. And hence slowly, uh, right, uh, the four micro manufacturing applications, the laser was uh, replaced with some other uh, different types of lasers. So one area of uh, such micro manufacturing uh, is utilizing excimer laser, Excimer lasers are uh, so basically, there are some of these excimer lasers which are uh, described here um, or stated here. Argon fluoride laser, whose wavelength is 193 nanometer, krypton fluoride laser, etc. And their pulse widths are quite narrow and their uh, photon energy is quite large, uh, right? And the uh, uh, wavelength is short enough. Uh, the heat, most of the time, the heat, uh, what is uh, being uh, generated is confined to the laser ablation zone, etc. So it is very useful for various applications in photolithography, pulsed laser deposition, micro machining, etc. And recently, uh, there are some uh, developments where we can also make use of solid state lasers. One of them is a nanosecond pulsed uh, solid state laser, which is neodymium YAG, 
YAG stands for yttrium aluminum garnet, and it is uh, also a pulsed uh, laser, and which also provides uh, right uh, very good features as far as micro machining and pulsed laser deposition is concerned. With a shorter wavelength, it has um, uh, so, so, uh, fundamental wavelength is 1064 nanometer. However, uh, it uh, it has a second, third, and fourth harmonic output, which is useful for various uh, micro machining and uh, laser pulsed laser deposition applications. So this is another uh, solid state laser, which is uh, one solid state laser. Another one is titanium sapphire laser. Uh, it is a broad spectral bandwidth and it results in mode locked laser output with a uh, pulse width as short as uh, right theoretically maybe six femtosecond or so, but it's around 100 femtosecond. So I can say, we can say that sub picosecond, 100 femtosecond pulse width is easily attainable with titanium sapphire laser. Since the pulse Pulse width of the laser output is quite uh, right narrow, right? Uh, this uh, let's say this is a uh, time, and uh, this is uh, intensity i. Uh, sorry, power or uh, right power uh, 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 energy is uh, 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 let's say i. Then we can say that since the pulse width is narrow, few hundreds of femtosecond few hundreds of femtoseconds, uh, femtoseconds, and hence what happens is uh, the power what we derive, peak power, the peak power what we derive over here is quite uh, large, at, uh, right? Uh, it's a te terawatt or even larger uh, output power is possible, peak power, because pulse width is so narrow. 10 days to minus 15 second order, right? So that allows a very large uh, peak power. And that is very much useful for various uh, micro machining operations as well as uh, multi photon ionization, et cetera. Okay, now the next one is, uh, of course, uh, uh, recently even uh, uh, fiber doped uh, lasers are uh, do ir yttrium, yttrium doped fiber lasers are also available. Uh, they also work in uh, welding and additive manufacturing, micro manufacturing, etc. Uh, but uh, their pulse widths are of the order of, of the order of. Uh, of course, mode lock lasers are also available, but generally their pulse widths are of the order of 100 to 120 nanosecond for uh, welding and additive manufacturing. While, uh, right, if we use mode lock laser, there are very good applications possible with micro manufacturing. Okay, coming uh, to the next part, uh, which is uh, just to give you an idea that the pulse width uh, or irradiation time is x-axis and the y-axis is pulse power density. And just I would like to state that whenever uh, power density is low and uh, we are working with a low uh, or long pulse duration, where that uh, aspect of the laser is very useful for annealing purpose or slightly higher power density is useful for welding, laser uh, chemical vapor deposition, CVD, laser etching, cladding, etc. So generally you will see that uh, the short pulse laser, uh, not, not very much, but uh, uh, approximately short pulse laser with high power density is useful for such welding, etc. When we go little very high intensity laser, uh, in terms of uh, long pulse, it is also useful for cutting, drilling uh, processes, etc. However, when we go to the short pulse laser up to of the order of 10 days to minus 9, and means uh, sub uh, maybe uh, maybe few tens of nanosecond or few nanosecond laser pulse width uh, lasers, they have a different applications in uh, maybe marking, a fine cutting, repair, or ceramics laser ablation applications, ALA stands for laser ablation, pulse laser deposition, etc. And if, uh, although I have not shown over here, if the pulse width is further short enough, ultra short pulse width of the order of 10 days to minus 12 second or a less sub, -pico, sub picosecond order pulse width, we end up with multi photon absorption, ionization, etc. Today, I am going to discuss about. Uh, nanosecond pulse. Most of the time, I'll be describing about nanosecond pulse with uh, approaches used for uh, texturing, scribing, surface alloying, doping, etc., etc., in my uh, talk. Uh, 
Uh, however, uh, we, uh, in some case, we also use femtoseconds. So I will try to describe them as well and try to connect you with the, what should be the future, our uh, area of research, which is uh, which will be right useful for functional device uh, fabrication. And the parameters which generally we will be talking about is the wavelength, which has a, which is connected with the photon energy, uh, thermal or chemical, as well as uh, it is connected with the material absorption uh, characteristics, etc. Then wavelength and focal length of the lens are connected. I means they are their end effect is feature size determination. Uh, beam shape as uh, also has an effect on feature shape energy distribution as well as uh, the the uh, right the shape of the chain micro uh, uh, right uh, uh, of uh, machining area etc the beam energy and pulse widths as i told you are related with the intensity of the beam and it decides heat affected zone and related parameters uh, effect Depth of focus is important for aspect ratio, determining the aspect ratio. Uh, depth of focus is also controlled by uh, wavelength as well as the beam size. Okay, the for, be, uh, for, uh, beam sport size will decide the depth of focus in case of laser beam. And uh, there is one more uh, aspect related to this is uh, in which medium we are working with. Uh, if you are working in vacuum or in air or in inert gas environment, uh, it also has some influence uh, or in even liquid medium, it also has some influence in terms of amount of redeposition, size of recast layer, amount of material removal, etc. which also we will try to describe in today's uh, right uh, presentation. Uh, in my talk. So first I start with a uh, uh, very uh, simple uh, aspect uh, related to simultaneous annealing of uh, uh, and annealing and texturing of amorphous silicon thin films. So our work we started a few years back related to simultaneous annealing and texturing of uh, amorphous silicon thin films. Uh, why uh, such interest? Uh, basically, we know that uh, the thin films provides a low cost uh, solution. Okay, and uh, the technology for thin film is very much developed. However, and it's going to go further uh, in terms of photovoltaic applications, considering uh, thin film applications will reduce the material consumption and improves, uh, right, uh, the, uh, so the adherence characteristics with the type of applications what we consider as well as organic semiconductor material can also help us in this regard. So this technology is uh, slowly it's developing fast rather I should say. Uh, however, we know that when we talk about thin film solutions, it is it will end up with material ends up with the multi crystalline silicone or amorphous silicone films or CIGS stands for cupric indium gallium as uh, selenide or cadmium telluride etc those materials can allow thin film solutions now when we are trying to use them for uh, photovoltaic applications or basically light gathering applications uh, along with the thin film of such material we thought that uh, the texturing also is very important aspect because amorphous silicone or multi crystalline silicone or even silicon uh, the absorption of light, incident light, part of that light is not getting absorbed, it will get reflected. So if we have a textured surface, it allows multiple such, uh, at every such uh, textured uh, reflections, uh, multiple reflections ends up with multiple absorptions and indirectly we allow uh, uh, increase in the absorption of the light and in turn, improve, improvised uh, right uh, photo uh, uh, electric effect or photovoltaic effect, I should say. Uh, so that improves. So now the textured, uh, the type of texture, etc., also uh, controls uh, the efficiency of such uh, thin films. So our interest was uh, why can't we develop a technique for amorphous silicon thin films? So this material is nothing but uh, amorphous silicon thin film uh, of the order of uh, 400 nanometer to 1000 nanometer deposited on or coated on a crystalline silicon material, okay, substrate. So this is a substrate 
And on that, uh, we did some experimental studies in order to realize uh, simultaneous annealing of this amorphous silicon thin film and come texturing. Why annealing is essential? Because amorphous silicon thin films, if they get annealed, the losses uh, which are involved in amorphous silicon thin films in terms of scattering losses and other losses uh, are reduced. Secondly, uh, we also can achieve uh, crystalline characteristics which improves uh, the, uh, the band with which can be coupled with the absorption of the light uh, plus texturing. So texturing, as I already told you, it allows uh, multiple uh, reflections and absorption. So in order to produce such a textured film, uh, we developed a wide area texturing using a two millimeter laser beam scanned over the surface. But while it is getting scanned, we use the beam overlap approach in order to produce such a textured uh, film. So we started with a, uh, a very high surface uh, polished uh, silicone, uh, amorphous silicon thin film. However, subsequently with uh, this approach of laser assisted texturing in air, in water, various such uh, approaches were utilized and uh, in order to produce such a textured surface. Of course, uh, as I already told you that when we work with nanosecond laser uh, assisted, uh, uh, right, uh, such a melting process and uh, re te uh, and texturing process, we uh, end up with uh, uh, thermal heat energy getting transmitted in surrounding region, etc. So the control of uh, this uh, textured surface is not so easy. However, what we realize after doing this texturing process that uh, although the control of this textured process is uh, not easy, but it produces certain type of texture and that texture is good enough for producing even a uh, something like a black uh, uh, equivalent to the black silicon film, uh, which is very useful for improvised absorption of photovoltaic set. So we converted amorphous into the polycrystalline uh, nature of the thin film and grain size of that film also increased. And when we use the water as the medium, uh, it improved. Uh, this characteristic was further improved as compared to the annealing in the air medium. Uh, that was related to the thermal uh, specific heat of the uh, 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 water, which absorbed the energy and then provided subsequently uh, required energy on the surface, uh, heat energy on the surface of the material to allow such grain growth. Uh, reflectance uh, decrease, uh, reflectance decrease because of the texturing. So 43% uh, uh, reflectance from the amorphous silicon film reduced to 16% because of this texturing and efficiency of this uh, n doped amorphous silicon film on the p doped crystalline silicon solar cell was increased by 2 to 3%. Of course, as compared to crystalline silicon film, uh, the efficiency was still lower, but uh, as, as it is amorphous silicon film compared to as it is amorphous silicon thin film, uh, the efficiency was improved by few percent. And we could also observe uh, appropriate multi-crystalline structure as well as what we evolved out of this is what is the uh, textured pattern and the roughness pattern which is essential in order to improve and reduce the reflectance and improve the efficiency of the cell. What we found out that uh, with the fluence uh, of the order of uh, three to four joule per centimeter square is good enough uh, sorry, I'm sorry, 350 to 400 millijoule per centimeter square is good enough in order to produce the textured surface and with an overlap of uh, laser beam per overlap of 30 to 50 percent is good enough uh, in order to generate the textured surface required with the uh, right which can produce uh, uh, improvised outcome. Uh, subsequently, even if we increase the uh, certain uh, parameters, if we try to change certain parameters, it doesn't have very large effect. And that's what was observed. Uh, the next aspect of this, we extended it. This approach uh, was subsequently uh, was extended in a different way. 
uh, now what i'm going to talk uh, in this case is uh, really uh, um, um, macro dimple formation on uh, the piston ring I, I should say as compared to the nano textured surface which you observed in the previous slide uh, here we developed a, a nanosecond pulsed uh, right uh, uh, ablation of a piston ring so chromium film deposited on the automotive piston ring uh, was uh, uh, right uh, uh, basically it was ablated so as to produce uh, dif dimples of a different size so such micro dimples were uh, produced and this dimple size uh, was uh, controlled uh, different parameters were taken into consideration in terms of the depth of the dimple diameter of the dimple etc we did some uh, hydrodynamic analysis uh, in order to understand how uh, the uh, uh, under a certain pressure uh, how the fluid uh, right will act as a lubricant and avoid uh, and reduce the friction etc the fluid which is nothing but the oil uh, right which is stored in this dimples and will try to help us in uh, always maintaining a certain amount of lubrication etc in in terms of hydrodynamic film and we uh, also realize uh, that with nanosecond pulse uh, such texturing of the order of 50 micrometer to 80 micrometer size uh, textured uh, this form what we or even more if, if we could control this of course dimensions of this uh, uh, dimples and what was observed is uh, uh, the textured surface was affected by heat affected zone as well as there were some redeposits, etc., uh, and uh, debris, redeposits, recast layers. Everything was clearly observed. Uh, before we go to the next stage, we we needed one more finishing stage in order to use this piston ring uh, for the real application. Uh, when we treated a similar approach, when it was it was adapted with femtosecond laser micro uh, texturing. Uh, where we use instead of neodymium YAG laser, we use a titanium sapphire laser uh, with a pulse width of around 120 femtosecond uh, with a, a, a pulse repetition rate of around 1000 hertz. When it was used, we could produce a, a micro dimples of uh, right different uh, 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 spacing, etc., whatever uh, means. Uh, 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 different based on the different parameters and uh, the surface was very clean uh, the textured surface was very clean no other uh, processing was essential and it could produce uh, the textured uh, surface without any additional uh, other process involved uh, and we also produce micro channels on the piston ring surfaces and compared their frictional uh, characteristics using uh, turbo uh, using uh, this tribology uh, instrument uh, for measuring the coefficient of friction in different conditions and what we found that uh, when we uh, we could see that first of all uh, without any texturing uh, the uh, the coefficient of friction was observed to be around 0.3 or so uh, after a certain duration of continuous uh, working uh, at 130 newton which is equivalent to the load uh, applied load acting on the piston ring and when uh, when we uh, 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 reduce when we uh, applied a micro channel based uh, such uh, films on uh, the, uh, my, uh, on piston rings so we could reduce this coefficient of friction substantially the further reduction was also observed with micro dimple as the texture formation and with nanosecond laser uh, the friction reduction of around 36 percent was obtained which was uh, further uh, right uh, improved with uh, femtosecond laser micro machining of course uh, femtosecond laser micro machining has a limitations in terms of the cost and the industrial right applicability however we can see that even nanosecond laser based micro texturing uh, can meet uh, to certain extent the requirements. Uh, then uh, going forward, 
uh, what I was talking about was uh, related to texturing or uh, micro dimple formation uh, of the surf uh, on the uh, right automotive uh, components uh, such as piston rings, etc. Uh, uh, right, our uh, parallel interest uh, is also uh, in terms of uh, developing uh, some other uh, so, uh, approaches for functional devices. So one uh, focus area that what we are considering is uh, if we can use a silicon carbide thin films and if we can dop this silicon carbide thin films uh, using laser assisted doping. Uh, why, why are we going with laser assisted doping? I'll try to tell you at a later stage, but if we can do that, uh, we can uh, uh, use, we can make uh, this uh, silicon carbide thin films useful for various applications, such as in semiconductor industries or uh, for uh, certain uh, uh, applications related to sensor applications at high temperatures. Because silicon carbide thin films can withstand a very high temperature without losing its characteristics, maybe up to 400 or 600 Kelvin. Uh, sorry, not 400 to 600, 400 to 600 degrees centigrade. It can withstand uh, some of its uh, right. It can uh, have. Uh, it can maintain, retain its uh, uh, characteristics as a sensor, uh, electrical as well as mechanical characteristics. So uh, we thought that silicon carbide film is uh, very uh, useful uh, for uh, fabricating or going forward towards the device fabrication. So we first established uh, this uh, approach uh, based on uh, laser assisted doping of silicon carbide thin film. So we deposited silicon carbide thin films using pulsed laser deposition uh, on different substrates such as silicon, magnesium, MgO, etc. Uh, and then this thin films uh, after pulsed laser deposition uh, were uh, right doped using uh, in, in a liquid doping medium. Uh, so as a liquid doping medium for aluminum doping, we considered aluminum chloride and for uh, phosphorus doping, uh, right, uh, we use H3PO4 hydrophosphoric acid, right, for this uh, purpose. And what we achieved is uh, uh, localized heating because of the laser. We could selectively do the doping process and near surface because of this laser material interaction. Some silicon and uh, vacancies were created in silicon carbide due to the thermal stress. And then vacancies were substituted with aluminum or phosphorus, depending upon which liquid medium we are using. And at the uh, far surface uh, from the interaction, laser material interaction zone, uh, because of the thermal conductivity of the heat energy uh, uh, right in, uh, in the silicon carbide film, we could allow aluminum and phosphorus dopant atoms uh, knock out of silicon atoms and then creating uh, vacancies or filling up of these vacancies by knocking out of the silicon atoms and uh, pr producing aluminum phosphorus uh, this based uh, thin films etc and we could see how uh, based on the seams analysis how this uh, depth of dopant is varying etc and uh, application wise uh, we, uh, we have developed a PN junction by selectively doping uh, these layers uh, with the area 330 micrometer by 330 micrometer uh, doping at, uh, and multiple such uh, right uh, 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 area, multiple such uh, ablation, I mean, so, sorry, uh, laser ablated uh, doping process. We could generate a PN uh, with uh, such a two millimeter by uh, two millimeters such uh, P and as well as N type silicon carbide, uh, right, such films, and which could be subsequently uh, used. And uh, at the PN junction, we could even see uh, electroluminescence uh, when we, right, uh, excite this uh, junction, as well as we could also see with uh, P and uh, such a uh, small uh, 330 micrometer by 330 micrometer uh, such a uh, uh, PN junctions were created adjacent to each other, and we could see even the IV characteristics, uh, which uh, uh, cut in voltage uh, of around 2.8 volts. 
and the rectification ratio uh, for this uh, right uh, IV character based on the IV characteristics was estimated to be around 10.8 into 10 to 3. So which we clearly saw that it is possible to use silicon carbide even for uh, right uh, different applications, of course, but uh, by using this laser doping process, the application area is getting widened further. And uh, recently, uh, we are also uh, working on uh, copper micro scribing of thin films. And here we have introduced an approach of uh, laser assisted hybrid micro scribing. So generally we know that now the application of copper uh, thin film has increased uh, uh, and basically uh, for uh, uh, in radio frequency uh, for RF applications for antenna uh, fabrications for various other um, uh, electrode, uh, micro electrode of fabrication, etc., for based on the copper film. Of course, copper deposition is uh, one approach, but in order to achieve very precise uh, material, uh, right, precise uh, width of the channel or producing the electrode size of a precise uh, of producer size, um, my micro electrodes with precision. Uh, we need uh, uh, right an approach. So we started working with laser assisted microscribing, uh, which is very, uh, very simple and very generalized uh, process uh, of uh, using laser beam and producing the microscribe. When we produce this uh, uh, approach, when we use this approach, we also introduce uh, laser induced breakdown spectroscopy based uh, approach in order to capture uh, the microscribing process over here in the sense that when material removal is taking place through laser ablation, uh, we could capture from the intensity of the leaves signal, that is the plasma, which is emitting uh, light, uh, the plasma generated during laser ablation was captured and it's uh, from its spectra, we could even measure what are the uh, right elements of the material, what is the material constituent and how the ablation process is progressing. So in fact, uh, the intensity of the leaves intensity starts decreasing as we go along the depth direction. And that was uh, that could also be used in order to capture or uh, in situ uh, depth uh, information while doing the laser microscribing. Uh, secondly, we could also capture uh, right, so the bottom surface uh, in case of copper thin film deposited face was either polyimide or uh, uh, composite material. Uh, so, so those uh, aspects are also being captured that whenever ablation process reaches to a point where copper film has been removed, we can easily see through with the ablation and stop the ablation process when we capture some other uh, optical emissions based on the composite material and not based on the copper. So those aspects were very clearly uh, captured. How uh, further, as I told you, we introduced uh, laser assisted hybrid microscribing in the sense that we introduced in the uh, laser uh, scribing in uh, aqueous uh, sodium chloride uh, solution, aqueous solution, sodium chloride uh, solution. Um, uh, in order to uh, realize uh, selective etching process when laser scribing is going on. So why etching? Because sodium chloride, uh, the chlorine uh, ions of sodium chloride uh, interacts with copper uh, to form cupric chloride. And that cupric chloride gets, uh, basically it gets uh, then uh, dissolved in water and gets away. Uh, however, uh, the, uh, when we are working with a laser at a high energy and intensity and material removal is taking place at high temperature, uh, the copper, uh, re uh, the reactivity of this medium with the copper increases enormously. And at the selected point where thermal energy is available while laser ablation process is on, will remove the material of, uh, will also help in etching process. So this aqueous solution provides a thermal protection over and above. It also helps us in removing the material through uh, etch, simultaneous etching process. And we could also observe that as compared to the air, uh, in air where the microscribing resulted into recast layer and debris, etc. 
was not seen when the same similar uh, approach was used in aqueous uh, sodium chloride solution. And a very clear uh, uh, right microscribing channel was observed. As compared to water, even the microscribing channel was quite uniform and the roughness of the bottom surface, roughness uh, texture was also very much uh, controlled as compared to the microscribing in water. Uh, this is, of course, uh, due to the micro etching process, which is happening in the high temperature region because of the high reactivity. And that helped us to even fabricate uh, frequency selective surfaces on this uh, composite, uh, copper deposited composite film. And we used it in order to capture uh, the frequency selective response. So uh, we could see that the, uh, with respect to the design of uh, this uh, FSS or frequency selective surface, uh, we could observe a corresponding S11 uh, peaks, uh, uh, of course, uh, the uh, transmission peaks as well as uh, uh, S21 transmission peaks. Uh, they were compared with the simulation results and et cetera. Of course, uh, still a uh, lot of work is essential in order to extend this application uh, towards um, uh, right, uh, using a co copper based such a frequency selective surface. Uh, uh, the processing technique has yet to be further established, but we could uh, clearly show that it is possible to produce such a microscribing. Okay. And, uh, 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 of course, uh, I, I'm sorry, the title of this is not matching. However, we extended this uh, process uh, towards uh, uh, even weighting uh, of uh, this uh, uh, copper as well as aluminum tin films uh, by texturing a process. So we just, uh, pick, uh, we just uh, use the silicon tin films or tin sheets as well as aluminum tin sheets of uh, different uh, right characteristics, I mean, uh, uh, surface characteristics, and then uh, applied the uh, laser texturing on that nanosecond based laser texturing. But uh, surprisingly, what we observed that after uh, the texturing is over, we observed that it was a hydrophilic uh, substance, uh, substance uh, surface which was observed. But uh, by exposing this aluminum thin sets or copper thin sets in uh, with time, uh, this hydrophilic structure uh, got uh, slowly got converted into uh, hydrophilic uh, structure. And this mechanism was also studied uh, from the application point of view in order to realize the, and understand the mechanism of this uh, hydrophobic structure formation. Uh, which is uh, very useful for uh, thermal and various other applications, uh, right? However, our interest and our interest in this area is towards uh, selective uh, texturing of the surfaces in order to produce selectively hydrophilic as well as hydrophobic surfaces uh, for various applications. So as it is indicated here that when the aluminum as it is sheet was used, uh, the contact angle was uh, surface contact angle was 58 degree, but after texturing, uh, it reduced to less than 10 degree. However, with aging effect, uh, uh, right, the uh, surface uh, texturing be, uh, uh, right connect uh, with aging effect resulted in uh, this uh, type of hydrophobic surfaces. So uh, we uh, so, so this analysis clearly showed. Uh, that how texturing combined with the aging effect combined with the organic uh, right uh, or oxidizing uh, medium etc how this uh, hydrophobic surfaces can be generated so overall what i discussed in last uh, 40 uh, minutes or so is basically lasers are increasingly employed for precise micro machining uh, and uh, the different processes are possible because of the contactless technique. Uh, we focused more or less, we focused on laser based texturing of the surfaces, starting with uh, amorphous silicon thin film, uh, extending it to the uh, macro texturing, uh, such as of, uh, macro dimple formation, etc., on uh, lubricating surfaces, etc. 
then uh, further going towards uh, doping process and subsequently even working with uh, uh, microscribing in order to generate uh, various uh, functional uh, devices. And uh, now we are also working on laser uh, assisted hybrid processing towards such microscribing applications. And the finally, I talked about uh, how surface weighting characteristics can also be controlled by such a laser based micro texturing application. Uh, future plans are, can we extend this surface doping of silicon carbide films in order to generate PSO resistive thin films uh, and uh, select at selective positions, uh, right? At different selective positions. And uh, if we can develop a pressure sensor which can operate at high temperature, in high temperature applications, et cetera. Uh, so such micro uh, thin films based uh, pressure sensors should have lots of various other applications in different uh, harsh environment and right areas. As well as we are also working on uh, microscribing of copper electrodes uh, so as to uh, interact with organic semiconductor material. Uh, because the work function of copper electrode is matching with uh, right the required work function for the organic semiconductor material. So that is our uh, one another uh, approach that where we are thinking about such a functional device uh, with the inter I means we are interacting with other groups in uh, the Department of Electrical Engineering and we are working with this uh, as well as surface texturing for generating selective weighting surfaces on metallic thin films for heat transfer and biomedical applications are the ones. Thank you very much for uh, your kind attention. And I'm grateful to the organizing team of IRIS, as well as uh, seminar moderator, Professor Koichi Sasaki, and uh, research scholars, uh, because all this work, what I described to you, um, um, right, most of this work is being uh, right developed uh, in terms of the research, et cetera, by research scholars working in the Department of Engineering Design. And uh, then I'm grateful to our uh, team, uh, Advanced Laser Material Processing Team, including Professor Samuel, Professor Fani Kumar, uh, and everyone. Right. Thank you very much. And Professor Ghosh as well, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, you. Abasa sir, Professor Abasa. Yeah. Um, Thank you for giving us a nice overview of uh, laser edit micro machining and also uh, thank you very much for showing us your examples of surface processes. Um, the question and answer uh, today is scheduled at the end of the seminar, so uh, let me move on to the next speaker. Um, next speaker is uh, uh, Professor uh, Pani Kumar uh, from uh, uh, his department is uh, uh, Department of uh, uh, Material and the Materials Engineering, IIT Madras. Uh, professor Panikumar is a professor uh, in IIT Madras, and he obtained his uh, PhD degree from uh, Indian Institute of, Institute of Science, uh, Bangalore, on the topic of uh, uh, experimental and computational science, computational studies on laser processing of these similar materials. And uh, he was an Alexander von uh, Humboldt Fellow at the German Aerospace Center, Kerun. And uh, since uh, 2005, he has been a faculty member at IIT Madras. Uh, he's, uh, he's working on his research interest is uh, uh, integrated computational uh, materials engineering approach. So uh, today uh, he will be talking about the computational science regarding the laser edit material processing. So please, uh, Professor Panikuma, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Sasaki. Uh, am I audible, Samuel? Okay, fine. So uh, today my talk will be on microstructure engineering through laser processing of materials. I will give examples from the past work the current work and also show possibilities for future work under the proposed center of excellence on laser processing. By microstructure, we mean material, how it appears between about 
uh, four or five nanometers all the way to about 50 to 100 micrometers. So something between what can be seen with your eyes and what is at the nano scale. So that is the lens scale, which is of interest for materials people. And that is what I'm going to show you how it can get changed by the use of lasers. So this work was funded by many funding agencies in the past for which I am very thankful. And uh, of course, all our work is done by research scholars. So I'm mentioning here my master's research scholar, Sivaji, and PhD scholars, Hariharan and Dasari Mohan for their work. So the outline is that I will describe some features of laser processing that are useful for materials community and give examples of welding, cladding, remelting, and additive manufacturing, which come of interest for materials people from the laser processing and mention few advances that are happening in this domain. So why the laser is very interesting for us is because it has a very variable orders of magnitude for the intensity of heat. So we could apply a very small amount of heat to raise the temperature by just a few Kelvin to a lot of heat that can actually ablate the material. And we could also give that heat either continuously or as a pulse. And uh, Professor Vasa has given you a very good overview of all these possibilities. Particularly interesting for us in materials is the spatial distribution. Sometimes we can focus the laser to give heat at a single location and melt the material. Sometimes we can spread it around like a donut shape heat source distribution so that the heat is slightly widely distributed and it is used for surface treatment. And thanks to the advances in the laser processing, we have many types of lasers which have different wavelengths. And as we know that if you go to smaller wavelengths, they couple with materials better and more efficiently. So that is also of interest. And finally, the path, we can actually numerically control the trajectory of the laser heat source to achieve rastering. By that, we mean the localized heat can be moved so that we can actually reproduce those patterns in the microstructure for our benefit. So why would we want to do that? We want to do that because in materials, we are interested in doing heat treatment to achieve the required phase transformations and therefore control the microstructure. And as you can see from this tetrahedron, that microstructure would be achieved by changing the processing and it will control the properties and therefore the performance of a final object. Particularly interesting would be the melting and solidification because that is of recent interest in 3D printing. And of course, there are also applications on ablation and deposition, as Professor Vasa has mentioned just a while back. So here are some examples. If you were to take dissimilar materials and place them side by side, and you want to join them, normally, because their physical properties are very different, a traditional methods like an arc heat source would not work very well because the copper side is very highly conducting, all the heat will go away and will not melt. But using laser, you can achieve that. And here is an example to show you that copper and nickel can be joined very nicely. And the temperature uh, distribution is slightly skewed towards the nickel because it is of lower thermal conductivity. Several publications have come out of this work, which are linked uh, in the purple color there. And we can actually simulate this entire process because the laser heat source is a pure heat source, just only the heat. There are no chemical reactions that are involved in giving that heat to the material. And therefore, we can model them using the standard uh, techniques which are used in the computational fluid dynamics. And therefore, we can actually reproduce what would happen to the material when such a heat is applied. And here you can see that the uh, thermal contours are appearing very close to what the experimental image has shown us just a moment back. And you could also see that the molten region evolves in a way that uh, the copper side is actually melting very minimally and is alive as a molten region only for a small time. So these kind of uh, features are then uh, made use of to join them, uh, which are not possible using other techniques. You could also use the lasers to deposit materials on top of other materials. 
And this today, when you do it track by track and on top of each other, you would call it as additive manufacturing. And uh, if you do the cladding, and that means placing a material using the powder or wire molten and then depositing on another material, what would happen is that you can build the material as a track. And sometimes you can actually achieve uh, microstructures which are otherwise very difficult. For example, if you take bismuth and aluminum, that is very useful for abrasion applications. It's called as uh, a, 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 a part which is used to, uh, in rotating uh, uh, objects which are in contact, the bismuth would melt and uh, therefore it would give a lower friction coefficient. But uh, because of the density difference, if you try to do using traditional methods, the bismuth would actually sink to the bottom and it would not work out. But here, thanks to the rapid processing, using lasers, you could actually achieve a very good distribution of bismuth particles in aluminum matrix. And you could also model that entire process using the CFD techniques and be able to predict what would be the size of the particles. And you could also get exotic microstructures, metastable microstructures using lasers. Uh, in this example of aluminum, which is deposited on nickel, what we see is a metastable microstructure called omega. Uh, which is uh, here as I show here. So, and you also see what are called uh, the uh, antiphase domain walls, which indicate that the chemical ordering uh, has been tampered with. And as uh, the laser has processed, initially we had a disordered material, and after that it has got chemically ordered and leading to these boundaries. And uh, you could also get very high cooling rates during the laser processing. Here you can see that you could get in excess of about almost about a million Kelvin per second, which actually is uh, uh, going to give you uh, structures like martensite. Okay, here you can see that the, the twins that are seen here are signatures of a martensitic phase. So in these systems, these microstructures are not very common. And so we can actually explore the metastable microstructures using lasers as a way to achieve. Now, what more can you do? You could also then uh, produce quasi-crystals using laser cladding. Uh, you may have heard of uh, Professor Dan Shetman, who has won Nobel Prize for his discovery of quasi-crystals. And these quasi-crystals are not very easy to manufacture in bulk, but if you want them on the surface, uh, it is going to be useful because they have very low friction coefficient. Uh, and uh, you could actually make them by using elemental mixture of uh, powders on aluminum substrate. We can tune the composition in one or two iterations, which we have done, and then produce the quasi-crystals, which are proven uh, by the icosahedral ordering or the dodecahedral ordering, uh, decagonal quasi-crystal, uh, the tenfold symmetry that you are able to see here. So these kind of uh, exotic uh, phases can be produced uh, through laser cladding which are very difficult through other techniques, uh, thanks to the high speed processing available with lasers. So by this, I summarize for now, as laser welding enables joining of dissimilar metals, which is otherwise not easy, laser cladding and remelting can give you metastable materials and metastable microstructures. Now I take an example of a current work that is happening in our group on Haynes 282. This is from the work of uh, Sivaji, uh, who has done his masters with me. So this alloy is very important for uh, the power production. As you know, uh, today we would like to uh, get more uh, electricity out of burning the same amount of coal and conserve the coal because India is still relying on coal for power production. So the way we can actually improve the efficiency is go to materials that can withstand higher temperatures. So Haynes 282 is a proprietary alloy which is meant for such an application uh, in the so-called ultra supercritical power plant applications. And this material, if you want to use as a fabrication for structural materials, it should be weldable. And that is where sometimes we have a problem. So this is how the material would look like. You have those grain structures, and sometimes you have small particles, which are carbides, and they give some problem later on. And we can actually try to do welding using lasers. What we have tried is that normally, if you do with arc welding, there is no problem. But if you do with laser welding, you can have problems. As you can see here, you could have porosities. And if you go closer, you could also see that there are cracks that are appearing in the heat affected zone. Now, this is not acceptable for power plant constructions. 
because normally if you make a power plant construction you do not want to touch it for another 30 years uh, you would like to have the power um, drawn from it uh, decade after decade without any problem so we would like to have very high reliability with respect to the microstructure of that particular material now how do we actually avoid such cracks which are very typical in laser welding so if you can see the shape of the weld um, we see that those cracks would then later on uh, give rise to a different kind of a precipitation uh, at those uh, locations where there are these uh, uh, heat affected zone cracks and that's not good in the long run so what we do is that we try to simulate the welding process using the uh, 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 standard cfd techniques and we benchmark those uh, uh, welding uh, using the uh, experimental images and later on use those conditions to actually fine tune the welding conditions to avoid those cracks so that's what we have done where we fitted the heat sources so that the weld is looking uh, very close to that of the experimentally obtained one and after that we go on to do some iterations in the computer because we don't want to do those trial and error uh, using actual welds uh, so we do it in the computer and find uh, a combination of uh, heat sources which is likely to uh, give you less stress at those locations and also perhaps little more time so that you don't have uh, those cracking uh, problems and uh, we did the iterations now with a smaller set of parameters and uh, luckily we find that uh, our attempts are successful and there are two conditions where we do not have any crack so here are the situations here you could see that some attempts do give you crack you can see that we have played around with the heat distribution like gaussian on donut okay so typical distributions that are possible and we see that uh, cracks are very much common in most of the welds except in two conditions where we do not have them and the shape of the pool also is very different so this gives you confidence that perhaps uh, through optimum uh, uh, heat source modeling and implementation you may identify conditions for crack free welds and uh, that is uh, the power of uh, uh, laser as a heat source because it is amenable uh, to changing uh, the heat source uh, distributions it is also amenable for modeling and that's one advantage so you can work with lasers to solve some such industrial problems as we have just now seen now um, we actually now go, go into the next big topic that is happening across the world namely the 3d printing or sometimes called as the additive manufacturing uh, of uh, materials and we have taken the same material uh, Haynes alloy and this work was done by my doctoral student Hari Haran and we wanted to see what happens if you try to do uh, a laser uh, remelting of powders of uh, Haynes uh, uh, for creating objects which can be used for high temperature applications. For that, the modeling scheme has been elaborated so that uh, we understand the microstructure evolution in more detailed fashion. So what we do is we do thermodynamic modeling. Uh, we have uh, ability to get the data of this alloy for its density, uh, heat capacity, enthalpy, and so on. And we can also uh, understand the phase transformations uh, thanks to uh, the thermokinetic data available and we also have a tool called uh, TC Prisma using which we can predict what would happen to the microstructure like the particle size distribution of the strengthening particles that are used for this material like the gamma prime uh, what is the radius of that particle as a function of time and so on so we can understand the microstructure evolution as a function of the heat cycle that we give now the heat cycle that we give is also coming from the laser processing as a part of the 3D printing. So therefore it's actually a nice loop that we are uh, connecting. And when very important element of this particular approach is the so-called phase field modeling. Uh, this is basically an approach where uh, we are able to simulate the microstructure using the so-called diffuse interface approach or moving boundary approach or even Stefan problems as some people call it. Uh, we have a commercial tool as well as our own uh, uh, in-house developed uh, programs for this and we are able to then look at the microstructure evolution what happens when laser melts these alloys and moves on and how does the material look like after that okay and so we actually assemble all these tools to form daisy chains so that we can optimize and you would see a very surprising outcome after we have optimized and made this 3d printing of the Haynes to it to alloy so we have some uh, initial trials to ensure that uh, we don't have much porosity and we have some good structure uh, desirable structure that is coming from the printing 
after ensuring that uh, we can then go on to do what is called a post processing that is after the alloy is made we do some heat treatment so that we can uh, have the gamma pi precipitates appear to give the strength and as you can already see here uh, uh, you could see that the strength increases significantly uh, when you actually do the aging treatment okay now what happens here is after you do 3d printing and then age uh, the strength levels are actually better than uh, rot alloys okay so by by small margin but you can uh, see here uh, for the elongation actually slightly lower not below 10 percent so it's acceptable but if you look at the yield strength it is actually better it is better than the rot alloy which means that uh, the optimum combination of the rastering that we have chosen and the heat treatment we have given has made the 3D printed component after aging better than the rot component, which is generally surprising. It is not very common. And uh, we can actually understand that by being able to simulate the uh, laser heat source evolution and how that is affecting the microstructure. So what you see here is how the laser is moving uh, as a top view, and this is a cross-sectional view. And there is a temperature gradient that you can see from the gradient of the uh, temperature contents here. And under those gradients, if you have the solidification happening, how does the material solidify? That is what is the output of a phase field simulation. And we have done those calculations and shown uh, how this will actually positively affect uh, the uh, uh, improvement in the strength. And uh, obviously, the validation is important. So we are also validating this microstructure to look at the scale the composition profiles, etc., across the distance over which these uh, undulations are created by the process of growth. Okay, so what this also means is also one very important outcome uh, for the industry. Normally, uh, when people make uh, objects out of these alloys, which are called as gamma, gamma prime, nickel-based super alloys, normally you have to do what is called a homogenization treatment. That is, you have to hold the material at high temperature uh, for several hours to make all these compositional gradient flatten out. And after that, you give the heat treatment so that you have the precipitate to appear and then the material is strong for you to use in an application. Now, if you do the 3D printing, what we are showing is that you do not need to give the homogenization treatment, which means that you save the production cost by several hours and reduce the cost of producing the final component, which is actually a good news uh, in, the, in terms of the final object to be manufactured. Okay, so this is the advantage that we have seen, and we then uh, dwell more into the microstructural tuning by the laser processing, and that was done in uh, Mohan's work, and we just go further on that. Now, why lasers are very attractive for microstructural uh, uh, tuning is as follows. If you see here in the x-axis, the temperature gradient is being varied. And in the y-axis, the velocity, that is the speed at which the solidification can be varied. And you can see there, there's a map here. It, this map actually is a microstructural map. It shows you that different processes can be giving you different type of microstructures. For example, if you take a laser welding, it shows that you can actually have either planar microstructure or columnar microstructure or dendritic microstructure. And if you take this DS, this is the directional solidification process which is used uh, to make superalloy blades for aero engines. And you could see that you could have equiaxed or even columnar kind of microstructures. And casting is here. So any manufacturing process can be mapped over into this domain. And our uh, advantage with the lasers is that you can access any part of this domain because lasers have a good variability in terms of the temperature gradients it can give you and also the velocity with which you can move the laser. So that is the advantage that we are going to show you. So remember again, the temperature gradient is a variability that you can actually take advantage of. Okay, so we have the models that is developed. These are in-house codes that are developed. So some of these equations may not make sense at this moment, but I want to tell you where does actually the laser have an effect in these microstructural evolution. If you look at the temperature that is imposed, the temperature gradient and the velocity are input parameters in the thermal field. And as we know, in laser processing, you can control the temperature gradient and you can also change the velocity significantly. So therefore, you can control the microstructure evolution in these materials using laser processing. That's the advantage. Now, these calculations are uh, quite tedious. You know, they take a long time to run. 
So we do those calculations on supercomputers. So we do it on uh, uh, graphical uh, processing units also, GPU computing. And uh, when we want to do computation on a big domain, like uh, let us say 2000 by 2000 by 2000 grid points, uh, you know that it runs into billions of uh, grid points. And uh, those many uh, calculations over a million time steps for the microstructure evolution would mean a long time. So what we do is we split the domain and give it to multiple processors to do the computation and assemble the data back. And uh, that is an approach that is followed in many of the uh, microstructural simulations. And you can then look at how from the fundamental principles without any assumptions on the microstructure, you can create what actually would the material look like at that scale of about 10 microns also. Okay, so this microstructure is simulated from the fundamental principles and uh, it doesn't assume anything about the shapes yet. Okay, so these microstructures can then be seen whether they are in the reality or not. A uh, very important outcome is that it would also tell you how the different elements will get segregated during this laser processing. And sometimes it can be uh, tuned for our advantage as I will show you with an example in a moment. Okay, so we take an alloy, which is an industrial important alloy called Inconel 718, which is very popular for uh, the uh, aerospace industries. So it's a nickel-based super alloy. And uh, uh, the technique that is used is the selective uh, melting of uh, powders by using a laser. So you move the laser on the powder bed and you melt the region and that region is going to be solidified and then the microstructure is forming in those regions. Okay, so we then look at uh, how we can understand what is happening in the material. So at the component level, you can take a CAD drawing of the component, slice it and make the laser move in the path to fill the entire structure and create a component. You can make an impeller out of the powder, for example. Okay, now when you look at a micro scale, you have a melt pool that is happening which is actually the place where the powder is becoming a solid. And uh, this melt pool is uh, experiencing certain temperature gradients, which are a processing condition coming from the laser. And this is one of the most important parameters that controls the microstructure. And uh, when you go one level below, you have the microstructure of the uh, material. And further below, you have got the atomistics and molecular and electronic structures, etc. all of them playing a role. Uh, in the uh, vertical integration of the so-called ICME approach. However, I will just show you that today we have the capability, uh, very uh, unique in our country, that is uh, uh, we can actually simulate how the microstructure would look like in three dimensions uh, for multiple components of elements under these conditions of laser processing. And this has been done using the GPU computing and using programs that are written in-house at our lab. And the size of the microstructure we can see is quite significant. You can see is about 50 microns of dendrite can be seen uh, calculated uh, quite easily. And you could then also see how the microstructure appears at a slightly larger scale uh, by imposing a temperature gradient. And then you would see that the segregations, etc., will be a function of this gradient. So you can then see what would happen when you change the gradient. So if you change the gradient from 10 to the power of 5 Kelvin to 10 to the power of 6 Kelvin, how the segregation changes, how the microstructure changes can be observed. Now, here I want to mention something very important. So these alloys contain niobium. Now, if you have more niobium concentrated in any region, uh, later on when we do the aging, that niobium would actually lead to the formation of a compound called Lavais phase, which is detrimental which is not good for the engineering applications. So we have to calculate how much niobium will get concentrated during this laser processing and try to keep it below a particular limit so that when we do the aging, we do not have cracking problems that are often seen in this particular material. So simulating is very good idea because we can't make uh, these kind of a study using trial and error. It will cost us a lot. So if you are able to simulate and then go back and use those conditions, that would save a lot of experimental trials. So what we do is that we make very few trials, okay, just a few trials, and we benchmark the experimental images with the simulated images. You can see that they are strikingly similar. We also benchmark the composition variations in the experiment with the calculations from the phase field approach. And once we are convinced that the simulations are coming quite close to the experiments, then we go on to identify the parameters using which the 
3D printing should be taking place so that you can avoid the detrimental phases from forming in the component. So that is one way by which the engineering of the microstructure is happening by tuning the laser parameters, particularly the rastering, uh, the beam width and the beam power. These can be tuned quite well to avoid problems at the microstructural scale. Now we can also do some more tuning of uh, the microstructure, uh, like we can actually tune the primary dendrite arm spacing. If you can reduce the spacing, the material becomes stronger. Okay, and you can actually study that uh, theoretically because you have got the temperature gradient, which is tunable in the experiments uh, using the lasers, and the velocity also is uh, available because the laser velocity is under our control. So you can actually find out what will be the cooling rate. And as a function of cooling rate, you can actually see how the dendrite arm spacing can be tuned. So we can actually fine tune or engineer the spacings as per the laser conditions, which is actually a capability to achieve the final component as you desire. And these microstructures are no longer only in 2D. We can actually see them in three-dimensional space also. And we can then go on to look at under what conditions do we have a detrimental phase forming so we can avoid that. So here again, you look at it, temperature gradient is one of the axis and velocity is another axis. And you can see the red color means higher value of the lab is phase. So it shows you that there is a particular regime of temperature gradient and velocity, which you should avoid because that will lead to larger probability of formation of lab is phase, which is detrimental. So like that, you can actually create these maps. Please remember, if you want to do these maps uh, using experimental trials, you would need uh, so many hundreds of kilos of powder, so many printed samples you have to make, so many studies you have to make, but you can actually do these uh, much, much uh, faster by using simulations and then of course do a few validations to confirm that everything is under control and then go on to use this knowledge for the advantage of picking the right parameters for the laser printing. Okay, so we uh, are able to now uh, move further to connect it with other commercial softwares to even uh, predict what would happen uh, when the 3D printed component is cooling after that, after printing, whether it would crack or not. Okay, so those kind of calculations which are requiring the phase evolution uh, uh, for this alloy we have performed and uh, determined what is called the cracking susceptibility. And we are able to um, comment on it based upon the temperature gradient and on the velocity and to tell you that what kind of a parameter range has less susceptibility. So which means that if you use those conditions, the built component would not crack. Now, if you ask industry practitioners, they will tell you that uh, many of these alloys, it's not obvious that you just simply place the powder and make a component. Very often they have a cracking as a problem. The reason why they don't uh, avoid them is because they don't choose the parameters uh, in a, a scientific manner. And here is a framework by which they can do that in a scientific manner. Okay, one last example is about the advances that are happening across the world, uh, where the nickel-based super alloys for the uh, gas turbine industry, we can actually make single crystals also uh, directly from uh, the laser processing, which is actually an extremely fast way of developing. Uh, and this is an ongoing work and future work in the next one year, we will be doing that. And across the world, this is the most happening thing right now. And it actually cuts down the homogenization time uh, for these uh, blades from about six hours to just 10 minutes or half an hour. And that's a long, uh, that's a lot of advantage uh, in these materials. And uh, in India also, there's a lot of interest to explore this particular technique. So this idea actually is not very new. Uh, the, the father of uh, uh, modern solidification theory, uh, Professor Wilfred Kruz has published quite a long time back, around two decades back, uh, saying that you can repair uh, uh, the super alloy blades uh, by depositing using lasers. And he has opened up a big industry of a repair industry for super alloy blades. So refurbished uh, blades were uh, then possible. And uh, today it's about a $10 billion, industry, $10 billion industry uh, that is actually flourishing. Now, uh, thanks to these fundamental ideas, you can now actually expand them to uh, grow further and say, okay, why just repair? Why not you produce the entire blade using laser deposition? So that is also something that is possible. Now, the fundamental principles for that are available here. So these maps, which I have shown in the beginning of my talk, the way the temperature gradient is changing in one axis, velocity is changing one axis, you have to choose the columnar regime 
and ensure that there are no equax grains forming and if you are able to play here then you can get single crystal so that is something that you can actually attempt using lasers of course you have to control the stresses so that uh, stress build up is not too much but there is a way that is the fundamentally from the physics uh, you have a possibility uh, to make uh, superalloys as a single crystal by using laser deposition uh, from these maps and uh, uh, by changing the power uh, of uh, the uh, laser uh, and velocities you can also play with it to get the columnar structure so if you are able to again uh, play in the columnar structure you can uh, ensure that uh, you can grow a single crystal so this is a very exciting area where it can be faster it can be better it can save you money in the post processing and uh, Uh, it's only a matter of uh, uh, getting your calculations uh, calibrated with these models, and then go on to use those models to implement uh, these ideas uh, to develop a new product. And this uh, is actually ongoing work. We have some collaboration with the uh, Institute of Science Bangalore on here. So when you take a laser molten pool, you can understand what would be the gradient, temperature gradient around the pool. You can also understand what would be the velocity of the front around the pool. and try to map it to a parametric space and see which locations experience conditions that give you uh, let us say cracking or give you uh, equivax growth or which conditions actually give you columnar growth or which uh, uh, conditions give you uh, no crack for example so you can actually choose this by seeing which side of the curve you are and uh, once you calibrate this curve with a particular material then you have a framework by which you can actually achieve a crack free uh, single crystal growth of uh, a nickel based super alloy or for that matter any other multi component alloy and that opens up a lot of possibilities because uh, uh, everybody who has a laser uh, facility with some powder can start making uh, uh, very very uh, attractive uh, uh, components using uh, this kind of a technology uh, needless to say uh, it has a lot of physics background so which means that one has to also understand the uh principles of solidification quite thoroughly to be able to implement these so with this i would like to conclude my talk uh, overall talk uh, and leaving uh, much time for discussion uh, i would like to say that today uh, we are at a state where uh, metallurgists no longer consider microstructures as just a piece of art uh, but actually they are uh, predictions that can be computationally feasible so it's not only what you see under the microscope but you can actually simulate them in a computer and they are quite realistic so this is something that i can conclude based upon what i have shown you till now i can also tell that process parameter correlation is very much possible with microstructure that is you can have crack free microstructures you can have microstructures free of some detrimental phases by identifying which process conditions give you that kind of a Uh, microstructure so so that correlation is fairly uh, uh, established and today we are able to take advantage of that and i would like to make a bold statement uh, here saying that uh, today we can actually design a microstructure through laser processing of materials and that is computationally integrable that is you can sit in front of a computer you can actually play around with the laser conditions design a microstructure and then go to the lab and in just a very few Uh, trials you can actually get the desired microstructure that you can confirm under a microscope and go on to put it in a uh, real life application so the typical uh, life cycle for designing to implementation which is very short for let us say cfd community uh, in materials it is a bit long you know it takes many many years to achieve this but thanks to the possibility that microstructure can be simulated laser processing is highly amenable for uh, fine tuning today we can say that we can have designed microstructures through laser processing using computational approach quite re realistic and it is actually happening right now across the world so with that i uh, thank you all for uh, your attention and i look forward to uh, your questions if there are any i would be happy to answer and i also thank the uh, office of global engagement for giving me this opportunity uh, to present uh, my work uh, as part of our uh, center and uh, thank you also professor uh, sasaki for uh, uh, moderating in and with that i stop and hand over the session back to professor sasaki thank you very much uh, for showing us the many data um on the simulation of uh, uh, say a material change by laser irradiation thank you very much so uh, let me move on to uh, uh, the question and the answer session
So, uh, Professor Samuel, can I choose? Can I choose the questions? Yes, Professor. Yeah, whatever is relevant, and you can sequence. Okay. So, um, I hope to ask the audience to write questions to uh, the Professor Panikumar on the Q and Q and A box. So, uh, I will start the questions to uh, uh, Professor Basa. So. Um, the first one is too, too big. So uh, the question is, one of the question is, the, uh, <clears throat> how is the mechanism of the friction reduction with the laser texturing? Um, friction is independent of the area of uh, contact. So uh, how the friction reduces with the laser texturing? Masasan, please. One minute. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Uh, so I would like to state two important things. Uh, first of all, um, you see, when we learned in our high school about Coulomb friction, etc., we assumed that the surfaces in contact are so smooth and uh, there are no asperities, no other uh, undulations on the surface which uh, and, uh, right which interferes with this uh, mo right motion so indirectly we assume that way and we proceeded with that so in that case certainly area doesn't come into picture however when we consider in real life uh, the surfaces and they, when they in uh, right integrate with each other that is certainly due to the uh, surface uh, undulations, uh, surface uh, right textures, etc. Uh, frictional uh, characteristics will be different. Secondly, how laser is uh, helping us in this? So, what uh, is being done in case of automotive uh, piston ring is we produce the dimpled surface on the piston ring. And uh, when the automotive cylinder, uh, uh, right, a piston uh, moves in the cylinder in the automotive cycle, uh, the piston ring, right, carries uh, the oil from the oil well, and it also ensures lubrication of surface. And uh, when piston ring is carrying the oil, uh, that oil will get uh, into those dimpled surface. Uh, will get trapped small amount of oil and when uh, the uh, when there is a, a, uh, at the top day near the top dead center etc where the oil uh, reduces etc at the time because of the force which is acting lateral force uh, on the uh, piston ring will end up with an hydrodynamic uh, right condition wherein the small amount of this fluid uh, lick, uh, 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 oil will come out and will produce uh, a thin film and that reduces the friction to a certain extent. Uh, that is our uh, uh, thinking about the uh, reduction in the friction due to the laser texturing. Is it fine, sir? Um, uh, Professor Fani Kumar, you can also help me. Based on your knowledge, <laughs> <laughs> I hope I try. Your microphone is switched off. Yeah, so I have I have already. I'm trying to answer some questions in the text, so that we have we can move forward. So I, I agree with your answer, and I think you have explained it uh, very detailed. Yeah, thank you. Um, next question to uh, Professor Vasa is. Uh, um, why the NACL uh, solution can give the good surface, better surface morphology uh, uh, in comparison yeah, to water? Yeah. Yes. So uh, I will just share the screen. So it will, be, and I'll try to uh, put it back this presentation quickly. I lost slide. I think this. Uh, uh, this, this, okay. So you see, uh, uh, please, uh, what we have done over here. See, when we were operating uh, laser in open air and uh, trying to do microscribing on copper thin films, etc., 
we observed that recast layer etc is coming into picture in fact even oxidation is also coming into picture okay uh, and when we did it underwater uh, just a plain water uh, deionized water was used and then uh, the laser microscoping was done uh, of course to certain extent uh, the uh, oxidized layer etc was slightly reduced but uh, still the oxidized laser was there and further undulations as well as surface texture in the bottom was quite uh, rough uh, comparatively uh, rougher rough and uh, what we thought at that point of time how to overcome this difficult situation of producing the micro channels with a very uh, almost no uh, recast layer removal of the oxidized layer and subsequently better surface finish so when we applied a uh, sodium chloride solution as i explained to you that uh, copper as uh, in uh, when uh, copper in a uh, copper thin, uh, copper film uh, re can react with uh, sodium chloride solution uh, or chlorine with that and forms a cupric chloride. However, this formation is at a high temperature. So selectively when laser etching is taking place, uh, the copper from here is forming a cupric chloride. And this cupric chloride re uh, interacts with sodium hydroxide because sodium ion and at, at that at, I mean, from here will form sodium hydroxide, will interact and will form a copper hydroxide uh, this which will get uh, it will get removed so the layer the uh, this basically cupric chloride is acting as an etchant a micro etchant which is formed and it is an etching away the surface and uh, of course it is only etching the surface where there is a high temperature during laser material interaction so combine this hybrid laser assisted microscribing allows etching also to certain extent in the selected area and it removes oxidizing layer it also improves the surface texture because the micro etching process removes the undulations which are produced due to the laser material interaction resolidification due to the nanosecond laser interaction with the material as well as uh, the uh, uh, the aqueous solution over here will also try to remove away those uh, right uh, uh, debris etc very easily at the time of formation so this combined effect has resulted in uh, a better surface finish on the copper uh, substrate or copper thin films um, additional question to you is uh, what is the composition of uh, sodium chloride in the water? Ah, a percentage, uh, of course, here I didn't uh, describe um, um, uh, uh, around 5 to 15 percent sodium chloride solution is uh, good enough in order to derive this outcome. If we go with higher and higher percentage of uh, sodium chloride solution, it is not improving uh, the process. Why? Because uh, the increase in sodium chloride in this uh, deionized water and solution uh, reduces the, uh, so basically it also affects the transmission characteristic of the laser passing through this. Okay. We use uh, uh, let's, uh, 532 nanometer wavelength light because it is a very good transmission through the deionized water also, so that uh, the energy doesn't get lost in, uh, right, uh, the laser energy doesn't get lost due to the absorption in the liquid medium. So when we increase higher, when we increase the concentration of sodium chloride, uh, beyond 15 or 20 percent, we end up with uh, uh, this uh, transmission loss. Hence, 5 to 15 percent is good enough in order to achieve this outcome. Thank you. <clears throat> um, the, another question is, uh, um, okay, why the contact angle changes with the number of days? Huh. Yes. So we, we have also, uh, see, in fact, uh, we have, so now I included that I realized that, uh, right, I had not included even references so that I have included uh, here, there is still error. I corrected this title also. So, uh, so we have studied this uh, with different uh, days uh, after forming a textured surface. 
okay uh, uh, we could see uh, hydrophilic surface however subsequently uh, we could see that as the time increases first oxide layer formation comes into picture and that oxide layer formation on the textured surface uh, starts uh, changing this uh, characteristics however as the time passes and with the air also carrying some organic matter etc uh, will end up with uh, even uh, in the initial stage of a few uh, right in the initial uh, in the on the top surface only for few tens of nanometer it also forms uh, organic thin film and that uh, uh, changes the interaction uh, because uh, as we know in case of a textured surface uh, the textured surface uh, the gap between the uh, bubble and the texture surface carries air but if it is uh, on the oxide layer or in an organic layer etc the interactions are quite different and it allows uh, such uh, hydrophobic uh, surface uh, formation uh, of course uh, still we have to learn more in terms of really uh, how much uh, the organic uh, right such thin film formation uh, really helps us in such a uh, hydrophilic uh, phobic condition etc can we create initially itself when we are processing this in the in such a organic uh, liquid etc where we can induce right intentionally uh, some type of uh, carbon thin film on the surface when the surface texturing is uh, being done uh, using uh, being performed using laser assisted texturing so those studies are still pending however uh, we are also trying to understand further in terms of uh, mechanism uh, but it is very very clear that oxide and carbon layer formation helps in such uh, conditions hydrophilic uh, hydrophobic formation uh, conditions okay thank you so um so sorry know. sir so sorry uh, sir i will just uh, see when we remove the oxide layer uh, from this uh, material uh, using during texturing we could see hydrophilic as compared to even uh, you can see that uh, in uh, in an open atmosphere without any treatment the thin films already have a contact angle larger than uh, in fact uh, newly textured surface so certainly uh, the uh, oxide layer, uh, this layers are playing some role. Okay, sorry, sir, I intervened. In Thank you. Um, I found uh, several questions to uh, the Professor Pani Kumar. I guess he already answered the questions in the Q and A box, but uh, I think it may be better to have the answer in voice too. So the first question is. Uh, uh, what is the possibility of laser melting hardening on aluminum alloys? Uh, I guess your microphone is not working. Yes. Uh, so can I have the question again, sir? A question is, uh, uh, what is the possibility of laser melting hardening on aluminum alloys? Aluminum alloys, yes, yes. So uh, as we know, most of the uh, usages of aluminum alloys are aluminum silicon uh, for automobile applications. And sometimes the silicon forms in a chunky manner and it uh, makes a lot of abrasion uh, in the piston ring mechanisms in automobiles. So using laser, we can make the silicon size very small so that on the surface of aluminum silicon uh, components, the microstructure is fine-tuned to reduce abrasion. And some of the high-end automobiles uh, in, in south of Germany, like uh, BMW and Mercedes, they have these treatments done on the engine blocks, which are made of aluminum silicon alloys. So the laser surface remelting and uh, hardening uh, can be done on aluminum alloys also, and it is being practiced for automobiles already. Um, next question is, uh, uh, um, Okay, cladding is uh, fire resistant or not? Yes, yes. So, uh, in general, we can clad a material that could make the material uh, fire resistant. Uh, for example, 
uh, when, when we see, let us say, titanium uh, above 350 degrees centigrade, uh, it has a tendency to catch fire under certain kinds of uh, abrasion. And so you can do some surface uh, cladding. So you could have, let us say, a nitrogenous environment and have titanium nitride uh, as a surface, which looks also good, uh, golden color. And that can actually reduce the exposure of titanium to the environment and perhaps mitigate some of those problems. Uh, fire retardation is also possible by having uh, materials that actually do not uh, react or uh, catch fire. So there's, they could also be oxides. And you, as you know, once it is an oxide, uh, then there's no longer uh, any other uh, possibility to release enthalpy, which is what is actually happening when we say something has caught fire. Uh, so, so by coating oxides uh, on the surface of any material, uh, you could actually avoid uh, the fire problems uh, in some of the materials. And, uh, and uh, uh, choice of uh, such techniques depends upon the actual application at hand. Our next is uh, how how can you can we manage uh, the crystal structure of the alloys with laser, and uh, can we rearrange the atoms where we need it? Yes, yes. So these are actually two very different uh, type of questions. Uh, we can change the crystal structure of materials using lasers because as we mentioned in the beginning, using laser as a heat source, we can change the phase of the material. So we can choose the material to go to another crystal structure and we can make that happen. And it is done in steels. Uh, we have surface treatment of steels uh, on the surface of the gear, for example, we have surface treatments done. So it is being practiced and it is very much doable. Now, coming to placing the atoms at our interested location, it is like using laser as a tweezer for atoms. And this has been demonstrated as a technology by IBM uh, some time back. And it is also possible. Uh, today, we have uh, techniques which uh, involve uh, uh, lithography using lasers so that you can actually remove materials which you do not want in some particular forms. And later on, of course, deposit a material that you would like in those gaps. So to build upon a, a, a structure that could work as a semiconductor eventually. So the lithography using lasers or uh, electron beam uh, can actually go to those length scales where we are talking about uh, maybe a few tens of atoms. And in that sense, uh, we can say we are coming very close to the objective of placing an atom where we like, very close to. Thank you very much. So um, we have uh, additional questions, but uh, I think it's time to move on the, the closing session. So uh, I hope to stop here. And uh, uh, I, I'd like to pass the microphone to Professor Samir, probably. OK, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sasaki. And also, we thank uh, both the speakers, Professor uh, Vasa and Professor Fani Kumar. I think they have brought out in a very nice way uh, the base, right from the basic principles to the uh, applications and the way uh, both of them have addressed the questions and answered them. It has been very interesting. So we thank uh, all of you. We thank all the participants also for their actually uh, involving and asking the questions. So thank you all. So we we'll thank uh, you and the team uh, from uh, Global Engagement Office, that is the international office in uh, IIT Madras. So we have, uh, uh, we have been instrumental in arranging all these things. So right from this was idea was from director and the deans and implementation by the team. So all of them, we uh, thank all of them for making this uh, possible. So now I'll hand over the mic to uh, Mr. Rudra from Global Engineering Office for conclusion. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your kind words. Uh, uh, I'm much delighted to uh, have, I mean, not only me, uh, I should uh, hand over these kind of appreciation for, for my entire team as well. Uh, thank you once again, Professor, and thank you, participant. Looking forward to meeting you in the next webinar. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Lisa, please uh, proceed for the closure. Thank you very much. Good night, Professor Sasaki.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>